Today, we will be discussing uh, financial freedom beyond your borders and moving your self-directed IRA offshore. Hopefully, you can all see the, the slide, our initial slide. Today, I will be joined by Scott Maurer of Adventa IRA, who's going to be discussing the self-directed IRAs and, and what they can do. We'll introduce him or he'll introduce himself a bit later in the presentation. So this first slide that I'm going to show you is just kind of an overview of Americans and how their financial assets are built over their lifetime. Uh, these are their financial assets. So these are not assets uh, that are physically held like real estate, but more of their retirement and investments and cash, different vehicles in that uh, standpoint. As you can see, it, the wealth significantly grows through the 40s, through your 60s. The majority of the portion of the financial assets being held are in your IRA or retirement accounts. So just some quick facts. Uh, in 2023, there was $13 trillion held in IRAs as of Q2. It had not recovered from 2021 when there were $13.9 trillion. So still building back up, but uh, quite a lot of money being held there in IRAs. The average balance is about 110,000, 109,000 as of Q3 of 2023, and retirement assets make up 31% of all U.S. household assets in as of uh, as of June 2023. So that's quite interesting to see that uh, over one third of of the U.S. is holding a lot of wealth or a significant portion in their IRAs. So before we jump into everything, just give you a quick rundown of what we're going to be covering today. First, we'll be talking about offshore banking, what that looks like, and working with an independent asset manager in that situation. Then Scott will introduce himself and discuss the self-directed IRA portion. And after Scott goes through that, then I will give a quick uh, overview of the state of the US and Swiss economies, as well as why am I talking about the Swiss economy? It's because uh, we're based out of Switzerland as a, as a company, but there's some other interesting facts of why. Then we'll talk about offshore investing and working with WHVP. So a little bit about myself, so you know who's sitting in front of this camera. My name is Jess Roberson, one of the team members. I'm actually a junior relationship manager here at WHVP. We're based out of Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, we are SCC licensed as well as FINMA licensed, which is the Swiss regulatory body to uh, manage clients as an independent wealth manager and asset manager. So I'm involved in the research investment team. I work on client onboarding and manage my own client load as well. And I help with the marketing strategy and implementation. In my free time, as you can hear, I don't have a Swiss accent. I'm an American, but I met a beautiful Swiss woman six years old, well, eight years ago, got married six years ago. I've been here ever since. In my free time, I'm either in the mountains or playing uh, rugby with the Swiss national rugby team. I, I really enjoy being able to compete at an international level. It's a lot of fun. It's a, it's a big challenge outside of, of my, of my working hours. And so I, I really enjoy that. I did my studies at the university of Southern New Hampshire, where I studied finance and international business. And then I speak English as my mother tongue and then German and then the Swiss German dialect. All right. So enough about me. Let's get into this presentation and why we're talking about offshore banking. This graph is quite interesting. Uh, it was uh, produced by Vanguard in looking at portfolios that are invested uh, or US based portfolios and how much of that portfolio should be invested outside of the US dollar or US stocks, really, and, and what kind of benefit it gets in reducing volatility. So, as you can see in the 10 year expectation versus just the overall, it's about 25 to 30% uh, being invested in non-US stocks reduces your volatility between three and 4%. And for, as an investor personally, any kind of reduction in volatility for me is a, is a big plus. Uh, we've been telling clients for years that moving 25 to 30% of your investable assets outside for safeguarding and portfolio diversification is helpful and it shows up uh, even in the volatility um, of reducing your volatility to your portfolio. Next, uh, I'm just going to talk about the benefits of offshore bank account, especially when working with an independent asset manager or wealth manager like WHVP. First, you get an independent partner. 
So you get a partner who understands the banking system, the jurisdictions, what's going on, as well as they don't, we don't have any conflict of interest in selecting investments. We uh, have our fee that we set up with you in our management agreement. And outside of that, we're not putting in investments where we get kickbacks. And that's something that can be kind of a concern when you go to a bank directly, or you're working with someone who's getting kickbacks on their investments. Uh, that they're placing into your portfolio, as well as the management fee that they get. The next thing is the direct access to owners. Uh, independent asset managers usually are small firms, so you have a lot of leverage in terms of if there's questions or uh, issues that need to be resolved, the owners are involved and have a lot more weight in dealing with the, the banks, and you get the continuity of the same relationship manager. So in banks, there's a lot of turnovers in the relationship manager, and in the small companies, the relationship manager is really going to stay the same for the long run, for the duration of your, 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 your working relationship. And so if there's a problem with the bank or you want to have multiple bank accounts, you get one person uh, that you have to be in the point of contact with and you get to stay with them for a long time instead of always having to change relationship managers. And you get the benefit of having uh, uh, the, the relationship manager has a, uh, a smaller client load. So instead of a relationship manager with hundreds of clients, you have a relationship manager with maybe a hundred clients at most. So you really get a personalized service there. The next is geographical diversification and portfolio diversification. You get to actually move your assets outside of the U S to set up a nest egg in a different financial jurisdiction that has different regulations, a different economy around it, a different system and how it's managed and run, and then the portfolio diversification outside of currencies and sectors, you're getting a really a holistic picture and a complementation to what you are already invested in in your US portfolio. Another portion that I think is very interesting, especially when working with a Swiss independent asset manager and Swiss private banks or in Liechtenstein is the Swiss Banking Secrecy Act, which uh, holds the financial provider to a confidentiality like a lawyer or a doctor to where they can't share your information with any third party. So you know that you're going to have a higher level of privacy working uh, with them because they are under law and it could be punished by fines and even prison time if your information is shared outside of, of the, the circle of trust, which is you and your relationship manager and the bank or you always have to, as an American, report your global financial holdings, but that's something uh, that you have the responsibility to do and make sure that that's done accordingly. Then you have protection against the devaluating domestic currency. The U.S. dollar has been decreasing in its purchasing power uh, year on year. Uh, the trend is downwards, and there are currencies such as the Swiss franc that have been appreciating in the long term against the U.S. dollar. So you get the ability to move out into something that protects against the purchasing power uh, devaluation of your currency. And then uh, you have the overall enhanced stability, as we mentioned uh, in the slide before, of reducing the volatility to your overall portfolio. Next, I want to talk about the setup and what that kind of looks like. Um, after this slide, I'll be uh, letting Scott introduce himself and talk to you guys about the self-directed IRA uh, portion. And so the setup is you are the client, you either contact us through this um, and we get to know each other, you get to know us, there's communication, you're introduced to the IRA administrator. In this case, uh, it would be Advanta IRA and you onboard with them. Once you're onboarded with them, we bring you your IRA to the bank and present it through a limited power of attorney where the IRA holds the bank account itself. So we don't have any ownership. We just work with the limited power attorney between you and the IRA administrator to manage the account. And we have contractual agreements to set up, set up with the custodian banks that we can ensure that the service level is at the highest level and that the account minimum sizes are brought down just a little bit uh, to make it more accessible to you as a client. And what's important here is we have constant communication between the IRA, IRA administrator and yourself uh, throughout the duration, not just the onboarding, but the running of the account um, and, and making sure that everything's up to date and taken wow. care of. So with that, uh, I would like to introduce Scott and, oh, and wow. let him introduce himself to you guys. 
Thanks, Jess. I appreciate you having me on today and appreciate everybody who's listening in and kind of help uh, put, put, you know, give you information on, on our piece of the puzzle and where Advanta IRA and where our self-directed IRAs fit in. So just a quick background on me. I'm a, I've been with Advanta. I've worked in the self-directed IRA industry since 2006. It was real, relatively new concept to me when I started. Uh, I've learned quite a bit over the years and, and currently serve as our vice president of sales. Um, my background, I am a licensed attorney. I don't do any legal work for Advanta clients. Uh, I can't prepare documents, things like that. Um, but I at least have the, the background, at least the, the knowledge base when it comes to dealing with self-directed IRAs and, and some of the kind of other aspects and other things that factor into uh, being able to, to self-direct the account. Uh, my contact information is on this slide, so if you need to, to reach out to me with any questions specifically about the self-directed uh, component of, of, of what Jess is talking about today, I'm happy to schedule a time to speak with you, speak with you and your spouse, uh, and your advisor, whomever needs to be on the call, uh, and explain more in detail, obviously, what we do for your specific uh, circumstance. So Jess, you want to go to the, the next slide? Um, so... You just mentioned already the self-directed IRA, and it's important really to define what a self-directed retirement account is. Um, there are a lot of companies that you, you know, some of you may have an account that says it is self-directed because your brokerage firm allows you to pick your own mutual funds, pick your own stocks, things like that in, in, a, in a U.S. market. Um, but what a truly self-directed account is one in which you have the ability to invest in a wide variety of assets uh, within your retirement account. So the IRS limitations on investments are simply that you cannot buy life insurance and you cannot buy collectibles. Those are the only two prohibited investment classes. But a lot of other custodians, again, the, the maybe the Charles Schwab's, the Fidelities of the world, they limit their clients to only investing in those assets that they sell uh, or that they will hold. And that typically with them, with those firms, are limited to U.S markets they do not allow you to take your funds on their platform at least and invest in you know a bank you know in a bank in Liechtenstein or, or an overseas market so in order to do what Jess is talking about with your retirement account you would need to have what's called a self a truly self-directed retirement account where there are no limitations on what you can invest in outside of again you cannot buy life insurance uh, and you cannot buy collectibles um, so the assets that we hold uh, at Advanta, we do not sell any products. So we're not, we don't sell uh, overseas accounts. We don't sell real estate, things like that, that people hold within their accounts with us. What we do is provide the service that when you make the determination that you have funds in an IRA or an old 401k and want to make that other investment, we will help facilitate that. So you can keep your money tax protected um, underneath the IRA umbrella, but be able to take uh, advantage of these other investment uh, opportunities. Um, Jess, you're going to go to the next slide. So again, I think the, the reason why more, you know, some of you on this call say, I, you know, you, maybe you logged in today to find out more about this because you, you, you hadn't heard about it before. Again, the strategy is not as well known because most IRAs, most 401k accounts in the U.S. are administered by either banks or brokerage firms who are only going to hold those investment products that they sell. Again, it could be mutual funds, could be stocks, could be a CD at a bank, um, things of that nature. But it's going to be limited to U.S.-based securities and assets. Um, there, again, the IRS says you cannot invest in life insurance and collectibles, but they also the IRS doesn't mandate that every custodian hold every permissible investment. So each custodian can determine and choose which assets they are willing to hold. And so those firms choose to hold only U.S.-based assets. And at Advanta, we will hold any other asset that is permitted under IRS rules. So this would include, if you wanted to invest in overseas, we can help facilitate you doing that within your IRA account. That's why we've worked with WHVP and a number of clients already who've chose, you know, chosen or made that decision to move some of their funds outside of the U.S. and into European markets and using our services as a facility and a way to do it. Um, so again, yeah, IRS regulations do allow for a much broader range of investments than maybe what you're currently being offered or currently have access to, you know, within your IRA or within your 401k. So Jess, go to the, the last slide or next slide. Um, so when we talk about what a self-directed IRA, one important thing to note is a self-directed IRA is not a type of IRA that the IRS you know, recognizes or has a, has a, it's more of a, a marketing term or a descriptor of what you're able to invest in 
with your IRA funds. But a self-directed IRA still at its core is going to be either a traditional IRA, you know, a pre-tax traditional IRA. Maybe you have a Roth IRA uh, at your other custodian. Maybe you have a SEP or a simple. So the self-directed name just refers to your ability to take money in a traditional IRA, in a Roth IRA, maybe in a SEP or a simple, and move that over into an, an, uh, that same type of IRA that you can then invest in assets outside of, of the U.S. market. So, for example, when, you're, when people are filling out our paperwork to get an account opened, you were going to tell us, are you opening up a traditional or a Roth or a SEP or a simple IRA? Um, the contribution limits, the distribution rules for these traditional and Roth accounts are the same, whether it's at a Fidelity or a Schwab or with, if it's an account uh, with Advanta IRA. So they, they follow the exact same rules for contributions uh, and for distribution. So when it comes to self-directing, which accounts can you use? Again, any type of IRA, whether it's a pre-tax, traditional, SEP, or simple IRA, maybe you have that after-tax Roth IRA, those funds can all be used. Um, also, any former 401k, uh, if you work for a prior employer and had a 401k, maybe you work for the school system and had an old 403b plan, Federal government employees have TSP plans. Um, once you're no longer employed uh, with those uh, entities and those employers, you can take that money and roll it into an IRA account, whether, again, whether it's at Fidelity or whether it's Advanta, you have the ability to reach those, those former employer plans. Um, we also offer solo 401k plans for people who are self-employed. Um, it's a kind of a special type of plan, similar to a SEP IRA. And we also work with individuals, you know, uh, doctors and attorneys, uh, CPAs who have small practices where they might have a pension account or a cash balance plan. We can work with those types of plans as well. Um, the good thing to note about these, all of these accounts is that you do not have to move your entire balance if you don't want. So if I had a million dollar tradition, you know, million dollars or half a million dollars in my traditional IRA, and I really just want to move maybe 250,000 or 300,000 uh, to start, um, you only need to move that amount from your current custodian over to Advanta and then ultimately invest with the Jess and WHVP. So it's an important thing to note when we talk about the different account types, that this is not an all or nothing strategy with your retirement account. Um, you can parcel out uh, a portion of the accounts to, to be used in this method subject to any uh, minimums that, um, that uh, you know, the, the, the banks might have in Europe to, to deal with. So Jess, I don't remember if there's another slide after this one or? I think that's it. That's my that's next it. slide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, just just a, yeah, just a, that's a quick, really quick overview of self-directed IRAs. You know, we assist in that process. Uh, moving money from from those accounts that you have now to an account with Advanta is a tax-free movement of money. And when that money gets invested uh, into the accounts that the Jess and his team manage, that is also a tax-free movement of money. So we're allowing you to preserve the tax status of your retirement account and take advantage of the, the opportunities that Jess is sharing with us today. Yeah, thank you so much, Scott. I think that's, you know, that last point is a very good point. We don't, we don't, uh, we made sure with you and setting up with Advanta that they got to keep that tax, uh, that tax, that tax benefit. And that's, that's a, a big portion that I think is, is quite valuable. So thank you so much, Scott. I appreciate that. I'm going to move on now to our uh, just kind of quick uh, current state of the U.S. economy, economic situation. Uh, I think what's in interesting here is this this uh, slide, the, the, the graph shown here is put together by Dr. Bill Connolly, and he is making the case that there would be a recession in 2024. Now, we're not saying one way or the other, but we're going to look at a few data points that I think are quite interesting to look at and 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 raise some concerns. And the first is that the American savings are depleting incredibly fast. Uh, in 2021, uh, Americans had about $2.4 trillion in their savings. And today that stands at about 900 billion. So $1.5 trillion in savings has been, has went out of US holders bank accounts into the economy. And that's concerning when you start looking at credit card, uh, debt that's going up that's higher than it's ever been in the U.S. And that shows a strain on the consumer in the U.S. And the implications on that uh, can be quite concerning uh, when looking at uh, the coming year. 
Then you have the Fed, which in general uh, has two mandates. That's quite interesting to see in central banks and how they're set up, which is unemployment and price stability. So they have to kind of balance their action and their decisions based on these two factors. And it can create a less efficient um, mechanism in, in dealing with inflation or certain concerns when it comes to price stability and the stability of a currency. U.S. inflation, which I'm sure you're all aware of, is currently at 3.2%. This is much better than 9% where it was uh, in the past recently. However, it's still high. It's still above the target. And while it comes down, it's not to where it should be. And this obviously eats at the value of your wealth that you're holding wherever you're holding it. Uh, if it's in cash, it's losing its purchasing power, and, and it's certainly a, a situation that is, is challenging. Then you have the government debt at $33 trillion. As an American, I can remember when it was at $16 trillion and the big stink that the population was making about it. And even last year, we saw two major credit rating agencies drop the U.S. credit rating uh, down, and the U.S. didn't really respond the people involved janet yellen essentially was furious about it and said it's ridiculous that they would drop this james diamond the ceo of uh, jp morgan and chase said ah, it didn't really matter that much so there's not a lot of concern uh, about this rising debt level despite 25 percent of the u.s government budget just going to pay off the interest and there's no plan in slowing this and this is concerning uh, in general as uh, a healthy level of government debt when you uh, compare it to the gross domestic product of a country ends at about 77%. And then it starts weighing on the economy. So the U.S. economy is not as free as it could be to move uh, because of this debt and the increasing debt. And then you see the global trend of de-dollarization around the world where countries are looking to start trade commod commodities between each other outside of the U.S. dollar where they had been trading it in U.S. dollars. And now it's not in a short term will the U.S. dollar lose its uh, place as a reserve currency. Certainly, we're not saying that, but if this trend continues, it can certainly be challenging in, in, in the economic outlook for the US. So now I want to cover just a little bit of why Switzerland, what's the background of Switzerland and Liechtenstein. Liechtenstein is, uh, is not a part of Switzerland. They are their own country, but they belong to the, the economic area they use the swiss franc so this is this goes for switzerland and Liechtenstein. they're very closely connected in terms of how they're regulated and their financial system and the, their jurisdiction so first switzerland and Liechtenstein have a long history of private banking switzerland's private banking dates back to the 16th century uh, their their stance on client privacy and how they manage clients dates back to the 1700s uh, excuse me the 17th century where they really preserved the uh, client privacy and ensuring that it was uh, a confidential relationship. In the 1800s is when they really saw their private banking sector start to grow and, and become much more prominent around the world. Uh, they, Switzerland has one of the largest uh, offshore banking jurisdictions in the world. Um, they manage in Switzerland right now, the Swiss financial system manages $2.5 trillion of the $10 trillion that is managed around the world in cross-border wealth. So wealth that is managed outside of the beneficial owners, domestic country, Switzerland's uh, financial service industry is incredibly large. That, that portion, that $2.5 trillion is about one third of the total assets managed in Switzerland. That sits at around seven, eight uh, trillion dollars that's managed in Switzerland. Then they have a really high priority on regulation in terms of protecting the depositor. So you, as the, the client who's using it, um, they have the Swiss uh, Deposit Protectionary Scheme that Liechtenstein also has, which is $100,000, is protected in the bank. Also, the banking system is set up different, and the banks we work with are not your typical large a uh, heavily leveraged bank, they're private banks, so their business model is totally different from that from the commercial investment banks or the banks where you can open up an account for free, where they make their money on, on, on debt or different investing activities. These banks' business model is through, um, through fees that cater the whole business to the client themselves. So their, their liquidity ratios are high, they, 
don't have a lot of debt that's going to cause concern uh, for the depositor that what would happen in a banking crisis, these banks are set up in a way to cover and protect their depositor. All right, so what does the current Swiss economy look like? Um, the Swiss national bank's inflation range, so instead of having a target like the Fed, uh, at 2%, the Swiss National Bank, which is the Fed of Switzerland, and they set it between 0 and 2%. So they're just having, they want it to float in that range. Uh, the Swiss National Bank has one directive, which is price stability. They don't have to worry about unemployment. That's the government and the private sector and the public sector's job to ensure that that's fulfilled. Swiss inflation sits at 1.7%. They did have high inflation when everyone else was having high inflation, and that rose to about 3.7% at its highest. So much, much, much less inflation in Switzerland and eating away at the, the value and the purchasing power of the Swiss franc. Uh, before the high level of inflation, if you went back to 10 years, Switzerland had a very stable uh, currency as far as inflation. They had five years where they had light deflation, very light under 1%, and slight inflation between 0 and 1.5%. So it shows that they really are good at controlling the value of the Swiss franc, despite the Swiss franc being a, a, um, a safe haven currency in times of crisis where people just flock to the Swiss franc. Then they're a wealthy nation with high reserves and low debt. What that means, which I think is quite interesting to look at when you compare it against the US, the US has a debt ceiling that's become a political bargaining chip and not a fiscal responsibility. And Switzerland has a debt break that the population actually voted in 20 years ago. They celebrated that this year, 20 years of the debt break that says the government can only have a certain percentage of debt compared to the national gross domestic product of the economy. And in Switzerland, that's 42, 43%. Their current debt sits at about 41%, and they're a country that continually pushes uh, surpluses. So they have years where they don't surplus as a government, they have a deficit, but they have years where they do surplus. And in the past 25 years, they've only had seven years where they did not surplus. And this allows them to hold reserves so that when something does happen, when they have to give out um, funds to the to the economy or to business sectors, they have it in reserve and they don't have to increase their debt. Um, in the US, we saw a $6 trillion increase in debt uh, essentially overnight. In Switzerland, their debt percentage level rose 2% in the time um, that they had to deal with this economic crisis. So they're really managed quite well. Uh, they cannot increase their debt further. Uh, if they want to spend more, they have to cut it back somewhere else or ensure that they have enough reserves to pay for it. So that's kind of the economic overview of the Swiss economy and how the countries run. And now I want to talk about how we at WHVP go about investing. We are not day traders. We are long-term capital preservationists when we come to investing, meaning when we look at an investment, we're looking a minimum three to five years for to, to buy and hold that investment. We want the long term to be better than making a quick dollar today and losing something tomorrow. So we really focus on stability and long term uh, with a long term outlet outlook. We exclude the US market and the US dollar. There's no reason for you to come to us for us to invest back in the US. We invest totally outside of the US dollar in, in, in various markets, in stocks, bonds, precious metals, and foreign currencies. When we go into investment decisions, we start with assessing the country and its region and the currency assessment. What does their national bank do? What does their, what does their government look like? How do they manage their economy? And then what, are, what do they have of value to offer? What are their industries that are strong? What are the company's attractiveness in those industries? How do they do? How are they managed? And then we dive in to the, when we've highlighted those companies in those industries and in those countries, then we dive in to see what the investment details are, what's a fair price for the, for, for the investment and what's the long-term outlook. Sometimes uh, a, an investment comes up, a company comes onto our radar and they're already in one of the regions we've done so we can just 
dive right into the company. And sometimes we have to then go back and reassess everything else as well. So what is the process? If you want to open up an account, what does that look like? How does that go? It's pretty straightforward. Uh, first, you start with a, 45, uh, a free 45 minute uh, consultation with us where we get to know you, you get to know us. Um, we can see what the options are. We get to know more about your financial situation. And we try to come to a mutual decision uh, if we can work together and how we can work together and, and, and what the outcomes are in that conversation we talk about the banks that we work with and 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 what your desires are for even moving out and and you can hear our philosophy in more detail and get to know us on a more personal level then once we make that mutual decision together to to move forward we introduce you to advanta and and scott and his team and they onboard you at advanta the great thing about the an, an offshore ira and setting up an account uh a uh, bank account outside with an IRA is Advanta does much of the paperwork. There's still paperwork for you to do in terms of boarding with them and onboarding with us. However, when it comes to opening the bank account that the IRA is going to hold, Advanta takes care of a lot of it. So it is a, 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 a lot less of a, a paperwork load for you to deal with. Once we've gotten through that paperwork and it's sent back to us, and it's given to the bank and the bank approves it and opens the account the funds can be wired in um, in this case with it with the investing obviously it goes from you or your current ira holder to advanta and then into the account from advanta and there you see it we make sure our clients have access to see their account uh, so that they so that you know what's going on you can see the the investments that are being made so if you have questions you talk to us and before any investments are made, we have the initial investment meeting where we go through each investment with you so that you understand why we're selecting these investments that we've researched. You know the companies, you know the idea behind it and why we've come to this conclusion, why we think it's going to fit your portfolio. And then we stay in touch. We, we have calls uh, with you throughout the year to talk about the portfolio development as, as well as getting emails from you. We encourage everyone to always email us back and forth. We also, again, talking about that access on the, on the e-banking side so you can see what's happening. So if there are any questions or thoughts or you can bring that up to us and we talk with you back and forth. So that's kind of the process. So there I would take this opportunity to share with you just our contact information. If you would like to schedule that um, consultation, you can shoot us an email. We'll be happy to make time and sit down with you and discuss uh, the possibilities with you. So I've come to the end of my presentation. I want to thank you guys so much for being a part of this, listening to Scott and I. Uh, we can go into some questions and answers. You can shoot those questions into the chat or the question and answers uh, section. And we, um, if you want to follow us anywhere else, we have a blog that we put out every Monday on topics uh, in that cover offshore banking and wealth management, as well as we have a podcast that we put out monthly. We'll actually be releasing the next one tomorrow if you're interested. We also do a weekly uh, short podcast where we talk about market indicators, what we've seen uh, uh, in, this, in the week that just happened and what we're looking for in the week ahead. Uh, we have a YouTube channel where we put out content that we think is valuable to you. And then you can find us on all of the, the different platforms if you want to follow us and see what we're up to uh, there. So with that, I'll open up to some questions. Um, if you have any questions for Scott and I, we'd be happy to answer them uh, now. All right, so one question is, what would happen in the case uh, that I would pass away? Uh, Scott, maybe I can pass that one on to you quickly uh, so you can share from Advanta's point of view and then I can talk about how we deal with that um, as, as the, the wealth manager. Sure, sure, Jess, no problem. So yeah, the for IRA accounts, and that's, this goes for any IRA and our, uh, the self-directed one included, you do designate a beneficiary when you sign up. So the account is in your name, but you designate you know primary and even contingent beneficiaries. And if you pass away, uh, your IRA and all of its assets then pass on to whomever you've named as your beneficiary. So if it's a spouse, it can go into the spouse's account. Uh, they open up their own and, and, and they then hold your account and all of its assets. 
Uh, if you pass this to someone other than a spouse, they open up an inherited IRA account. Uh, and then they didn't take, they basically received the account um, and all of its assets as well. So uh, as far as what then happens with the investment, with WHVP, I'll let you talk about that, Jess. Yeah, so in the case where you would pass away, the as you have set up with Scott, as he mentioned, Advanta would reach out to us to tell us that uh, you'd passed away and they would reach out with a closing letter and we would then go about liquidating the portfolio and it would then be sent back to Advanta. With Advanta as the IRA administrator, they're doing all the signatures on the account so that it goes, it flows through Advanta and then we flow it back to Advanta and they're the ones who would then distribute it to your beneficiaries or however that's handled. But the, the funds themselves would go back to Advanta from your IRA account. It just goes back to where Advanta is holding it. Uh, so the next question is, what are your fees? So our fee, depending on the, I'll let Scott cover his fees uh, in a moment of what it costs for uh, Advanta from our side, uh, depending on the service level, we have th uh, three different service levels. Uh, the main two, um, the minimum investment, which I can maybe cover there is 500,000 US dollars. That's a, that's a, a management fee of 1.5%. Uh, it's charged at a quarterly basis, but that's 1.5% per year. And then at accounts where it is uh, $250,000, it's 1.2%. So the service levels there differ a little bit. The, the two, 250,000 service level, that's a standardized uh, service and the 500,000 is a personalized service. Yeah, and just our, our fees for administering the IRA. Um, so some, some of you might be used to paying, you know, 1% IRA fee or commissions to your to your broker to Schwab or Fidelity, our fees are simply based on our record keeping services and the assets that we hold. Um, it's about $150 or so to get the IRA opened, get your funds transferred uh, from your current custodian. And then ultimately that's, that includes also the fees for getting the bank account set up uh, in, in Liechtenstein and in Switzerland and getting that relationship and that paperwork done. It's about $150, maybe $200 in setup costs. And then on an annual basis, we charge a flat $295 a year to hold that investment inside your IRA. It's just a flat fee, regardless of the value, um, whether it's 250K, whether it's 500 or more, uh, it's a flat 295 year annual fee. Like I said, after about $200 or so uh, of fees, been getting the account open and getting money transferred and moved and getting the paperwork completed uh, to get the, the bank account open. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, Scott. And with us, we don't take any commission either. So that's that's our fees straight out. And our different custodian banks have different fees. And that's something that we talk about when we have that consultation with you so that you understand the banks, which bank you would uh, best fit with and what their fees are. Um, but they're usually uh, less. They're not a 1%. But we don't have, uh, we do not personally have any uh, commission fees or performance fees. We just do the 1.5%. So we go with you. All right, let's see. We'll wait a little bit to see if there's any other questions. Uh, if not, then uh, I think we are coming to the end. So just maybe give it a few uh, seconds. And if there's no more questions, then we'll let you all go about your day. All right, so one, one more question is, uh, who owns the account? So with through the IRA, your IRA owns the account. Maybe Scott, you could um, uh, put a little bit more uh, emphasis on this. Um, because it's an IRA, it's held, when we open the account, it's held in the name of the IRA um, with a specific IRA number. So you're the beneficiary of that IRA number, but it's held through Advanta. Yeah, Jess, that, that's correct. So the so with IRA, you're, it's important to note your IRA is kind of its own separate, distinct entity from you as an individual. So the bank account at Kaiser or the, the bank that the WHVP uses is titled in the name of, say, Advanta IRA for benefit of you know Joe Smith's IRA account, something very something similar to that. So that is the actual legal entity that owns the account. Um, you, of course, own your IRA, so you direct us what you prefer to, you know, what you want to, you direct, you're directing us what you want to do with your IRA funds, but the legal titling 
for any asset purchased by your IRA is the name of the custodian, in this case, Advanta IRA, for benefit of your name and your, your IRA account number. And it, and it is tied to the investment in the bank account is tied to our, to Advanta's trust tax ID number. So that any tax reporting um, flows back to us, not to your social. That's another important part uh, of the puzzle. And we, that's part of what we do to make sure that that happens, um, you know, when we are, when we are setting up that account. 